Greetings and, and, and welcome to uh, everyone. We appreciate y'all uh, taking time to join us today for what, what I think, frankly, is going to be uh, an historic uh, hour, given what we're going to do today. This is Living History, uh, Conversations with Courageous Leaders, and that is certainly the case today in terms of the guests that we have, whom I will introduce uh, in, in just one moment, but really appreciate all of you being here. Our conversation today is scheduled to uh, before an hour. Uh, as you know, we started a little bit late, uh, so we're going to try to make up for that on the other side. I would tell you, though, that if you have to sign off at, 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 uh, at the uh, scheduled time, uh, we understand that uh, this program is being recorded uh, and will subsequently be put up on the ICMA website, and so you'll have the opportunity to see uh, and listen uh, to the entire uh, program. Uh, so with that, um, I, I, wow, it, it is my privilege and honor. I'm really excited uh, to uh, introduce our, our guest today. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, certainly a giant uh, in our, our, our profession, uh, the one and only Sylvester Cy Murray. Um, I'm going to take a, just a couple of minutes here to give you some some background information uh, on, on Cy. Uh, Cy is, a, as many of you know, a longtime city manager, professor, consultant, fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration, uh, and member of the National Forum for Black Public Administrators. Cy began his career as an intern in Daytona Beach, Florida. Uh, he eventually became the director of the city's planning and building department. He spent two years uh, in the United States Army as an infantry soldier during the Vietnam War. And after his discharge, uh, Cy became the assistant city manager in Richland, Washington. And then at the tender age of 28, uh, he was appointed city manager of Inkster, Michigan. His professional management career includes serving as city manager in Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, in San Diego, California. When Cy became city manager in Inkster, he was one of only two African Americans known to serve in the profession at the time of his, of his appointment, which was in 1970. His mentoring is renowned for working with emerging professionals and students. Uh, he supported ICMA's Minority Executive Placement Program, which was launched in 1970 and continued for several decades thereafter. Cy so spent several years at Cleveland State University in Ohio, where he taught and directed the public management program in the Levine College of Urban Affairs. Cy so attained the rank, of, the rank of full professor with tenure, uh, was awarded a Fulbright Specialist Grant, and spent a semester as acting department head before retiring. He then accepted appointments uh, to uh, teach at two uh, HBCUs, namely uh, Savannah State University in Georgia and Jackson State University in Mississippi. In 1983, uh, Cy became the first African-American to be elected president of ICMA, a topic that we will touch on a little bit later. Uh, he also served as president uh, of the American Society for Public Administration, otherwise known as ASPA. Uh, president of the Conference of Minority Public Administrators, COPPA, and president of the Consortium for International Management Policy and Development. And he has been a trustee of the Lincoln Land Institute, a board member of the National Civic League, and interim executive director of the National Forum for Black Public Administrators. Cy holds a Master's of Governmental Administration uh, from the Fells Institute at the University of Pennsylvania, and he has a Master's of Science degree uh, in economics uh, from the University of Michigan. And finally, uh, he was awarded an honorary Doctor of Laws from Lincoln University in Pennsylvania. That's a pretty incredible um, professional uh, uh, journey, uh, one that uh, still continues in terms of his contributions to our uh, great profession. And I couldn't be more proud uh, than to have this opportunity to uh, welcome you, Cy, 
uh, here today uh, to have a conversation uh, with you about the incredible journey that I that I just uh, that I just talked about and shared with our with our audience today. Um, I was really excited. You know, I'm I'm you know have in common with you the the the, the opportunity to to be a first, uh, have, being in this role at, at ICMA, being the first person of color, um, black person to serve as executive director of ICMA, uh, which, uh, uh, as I indicated before, you having served as the first uh, black person to be president of ICMA. We share that. Uh, you have been a trailblazer in so many ways, but uh, notwithstanding all that I've read, perhaps the best place to begin uh, is at the beginning side. So uh, with, with my welcome to you, can we, can we let's, let's start by having you talk a little bit about how you came to be involved in local government. Uh, let me, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, am I not doing something here that I should be doing? I can hear you. Can you see me? <laughs> no, sir. <laughs> Like, camera on? Uh, what should I be doing on this end? Well, there's a little icon with the camera. It should be at the bottom of the screen there, right next to the mic symbol. If you, if there's a line through the camera, then your camera isn't on. And so you would need to click on it to make the, the line, to take the line out. And then we'd be able to see your, see your face, your image. There you are. Now we see you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. welcome. Uh, let me make, uh, I don't see me and I usually can see myself when I'm talking. Yeah. Uh, let me uh, thank you for the, that uh, introduction. It uh, demonstrates that I could not hold a job, I guess. <laughs> uh, but the uh, one actual correction I wanted to make was the, uh, the master's degree in economics came from Eastern Michigan University, ah. not the University of Michigan. And uh, that's, 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 so that's the change there. Okay. All right. Okay. The subject of how I got involved in city management is long, but I'll try to make it short. And that is that I was born and raised in Miami, Florida. They had a council manager form of government. And uh, when I went to college in Pennsylvania, uh, one of the trustees of the college in Pennsylvania was a was the director of the Fells Institute, Dr. Sweeney. And when we had conversations, I was editor of our student newspaper and would cover the uh, trustee meetings. He um, he asked me what was my goal in life. Uh, I had caused some problems at the university, so he took me aside and asked me, "What's your goal in life?" And I told him I wanted to be a lawyer so that I can go back to Miami and make some changes in government. And he said to me, suppose I tell you about how you can get to government, make changes and not have to run for election, but people will select you. And uh, that sounded good. I went back, uh, I, did, I did go to his school, I did not go to any law school and in the process, I became a city manager, eventually. Uh, that's how I got started, Mark. Mm -hmm. And um, any regrets about making that choice, sign and not going to law school? No, no. Uh, I, what I learned as a city manager is that what lawyers do is read. <laughs> and so I found that if I read, I, I can be just as intelligent as the lawyer. Mm -hmm. uh, I did not have a, a license, but I read. And that made a big difference in my life as a city manager. Uh, of course, I read the charter for every city, but I also so I read the code of ordinances, not, maybe I didn't get through all of it, but whenever an issue came up that was related to the code, I read the code. And most importantly, I read the contracts. Uh, if the contract was uh, 20 pages, like almost all of them are 50, 
and I read all 50 pages. I think that made a difference in my service in the four cities that I was privileged to serve. Well, that, I don't want to interrupt you, but reading the code and the contracts, I mean, clearly that was important then. Um, if, if you project forward, you know, it, would you say that today it's still important for a uh, person coming along to, to do what you did or a first time city manager to do that? Yes, I would. Now the difference probably today than when I came along is that every city manager today probably has five assistants. <laughs> even, the, even one of them could be a lawyer. So if he or she has five assistants to do all the reading for them, then they don't have to do it. But when I came along, we did not have five assistants. Uh, you were the city manager. Mm -hmm. And you might have, you might have, depending on the, on the wealth of the city, you might have an assistant city manager. Uh, but beyond that, the only attorney you had was the city's, the city attorney who had, and in, in his, in, when he talked to me, he had so many more things to do than to teach me uh, how to read contracts. Well, you know, Simon, you know, to, 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 you know, none of us gets to where we are in life without the help and assistance of other people along the way. And I can certainly recall when I first started out you know, so many years ago, back in the early '80s, going. Uh, to my first uh, first city managers conference back in Michigan, the, the Winter Institute. You might recall that. Yes. Sir. Um, Winter Institute. Actually, it was in Ann Arbor where you, where you served as yes. city manager for, for yes. many years. But I remember that first time, and it was the first time that I saw you and George Cove and some of the others that were already in the profession. And you know, and and you guys were larger than life to me, and I'm sure all of the other young people that were there and of course over the years uh, served as mentors for us, right? We, we, we watched you guys as you trailblaze paths that subsequently many of us walked down. I'm curious to know that when you started out in those early years, who, there, weren't, there certainly weren't many African-Americans in the profession, who, um, who did you look up to? Who were some of your mentors that gave you, gave you guidance along the way and supported you? Well, the, um, the first one was a white guy. His name was uh, Norman Hickey. He was manager of Daytona Beach, Florida. Uh, when I finished Fells, I had to serve an internship. Uh, the internship was a part of the degree requirement. And I wanted to go back to Miami to serve the internship since I knew now that they had uh, a council manager form of government. But when I went down there, I wasn't accepted. And the, uh, the individual uh, who I talked with in the manager's office told me that they would give me an internship in the recreation department in the black section of the city, but I could not work in the city manager's office. So I went back to Fells and told, at least I started to go back to Fells to tell uh, Dr. Sweeney that it didn't work. And he told me to don't come all the way back, but go to Daytona Beach, Florida, 200 miles from Miami. But uh, Mr. Norman Hickey was just a, he, he was the best person I could have gone to. He, he taught me so much that was not just in the books, but he taught me how to deal with people. And he taught me how to, to listen, actually, because I was always one of those who did a lot of talking. And he'd sit me down and say, listen, listen. And he would send me on uh, to meetings and tell me that my sole job at those meetings was to listen and come back and talk and tell him. So he was, he was a, a significant uh, person in my life in terms of beginning in the city management profession. And were there others after Mr. Hickey? Yes. Um, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Hickey allowed me to uh, go to ICMA conferences. And 
he, I mean, they paved the way. I remember in Daytona Beach, the first conference, ICMA conference I went to was in Canada. And I had never really uh, been on an airplane a, a long distance, uh, uh, if it wasn't with the military. And, and I, uh, I didn't even have a suitcase to put my suits in. I, I, I bought the suits from the cleaners and the plastic wrappings. And I got on the plane with those in my hand. But when I got to uh, the conference there, I met more people. And one of the people that I met was James Johnson, who was a black guy and city manager of Compton, California. We had long conversations. Um, he, he gave me a lot of pointers. Uh, he, he, taught, he, he, he prepared me for a lot of the things that I'm witnessing now. I was witnessing. But other than that, and, and I hope I'm not forgetting somebody very important. What is really, other than my father and my minister, uh, I, I guess when they used the term trailblazing, that just were not that many blacks in the profession for me to go to mm -hmm. and talk with. And uh, well, that, that's... I, I met I met the most blacks in the profession when I got my city manager's job in in Inkster. And I met a group called the NCB Leo, National Black Elected Officials. And my training then came from elected black people who talked to me consistently about city government. They were council members who talked to me about city government and 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 their cities. So that, that's a really good segue. I, I guess you know, I was really young in my career uh, at that time, but I am curious, I would imagine the folks listening are too. I mean, what, what was that like? I mean, to be, um, to be a person of color in a profession that is uh, predominantly um, made up of, of white folks. Um, um, it, it stands out most for me when I think about it, when I went to, uh, to conferences and things, and you know, there were so few of us and so many um, uh, non-minority, non-black non women, very few women at the time, as I recall, too. Um, but what, what was it like then and, you know, the prospects of the future in terms of going on to, to other cities? I, I recall there was this sense that um, you know, uh, you know, with respect to some cities, you need not apply because they weren't they weren't ready or prepared to hire someone of color, or someone black. What was the experience like for you back then as you tried to progress? I I, uh, I always had it in my mind to progress. I knew what I wanted to do. Well, actually, what I wanted to do was to become city manager of Miami. I mean, <laughs> from the day one, that's what I wanted to do. Uh, <clears throat> And when I went to the first city in Inkster, Michigan, uh, I went there because the black mayor picked up the telephone and asked me to come to Inkster and interview for their city manager's job. And I was there just three years. But in those three years in Inkster, uh, and, and, and with me was a uh, was a, a city manager in training named David Williams, who was my, uh, who became my assistant city, ma not assistant city manager because the city was too small, but he came over and worked with me as the uh, director of our city planning department. And <clears throat> being in, Inkster is just to 20 miles from Detroit. So that period of time for five years, between 1970, maybe to 75, uh, David Williams and I were very involved in black city management activities in Detroit and in Inkster. And we met a lot of people in Detroit who became our, men our, our, our mentors. Uh, at my age now, I can't even remember the names of my dogs, you know, when I, when I apply for a 
or something, they want to know, do you have a code? What was the name of your first dog? Well, <laughs> I don't remember that. And I don't remember the names of all of the individuals who David and I talked to, but, but there were a lot of people who helped us. There were just a lot of people who helped us. Now, significantly, Mark, <clears throat> from that point on, I never applied for another city manager's job. <clears throat> there was a recruiter from California who came to me in Inkster and told me that he was recruiting for Ann Arbor and he wanted, he recommended me. <clears throat> That's how I got to Ann Arbor. That same recruiter came to me after six years in Ann Arbor and said, I'm recommending you for Cincinnati. That's how I got to Cincinnati after six years in Ann Arbor. And after six years, in Cincinnati, the same guy came to me and said, Sai, let's go to California. Mm -hmm. And from Cincinnati, I went to San Diego. I feel very proud of the fact that this, this young man helped me out so much, but I feel even more proud that I was asked to come to oh. every city. I did not initiate the application. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting. One of the expressions I've heard over the years about consultants, I've heard them described as consultants are career makers and career breakers. Oh, you're right. <laughs> and, and, and the advice uh, uh, that I was given when I was young, uh, someone talked to me about the importance of, you know, working to have a relationship um, with the executive search firms, you know, and there's a, there's a subset of, of executive search firms that are known in our profession, you know, primarily that, that, that do a lot of the recruitments. What, what you just talked about, had you been deliberate about nurturing a relationship with, with, with that firm and, and perhaps other firms to, uh, so that they would understand what your career goals were? Yes, with, with, that, with that one firm, not with a number of firms, with that one firm uh, and, and, and that uh, one recruiter. But my, my career goes to in-depth conversations uh, after I got in the profession were with other, other managers, actually. I, I had, by that time, I had begun to, to, to meet managers. And, and, and they would talk to me. But I also met mayors as a part of those that National League of Cities organization and the NBC Leo, we used to go every year. And you would meet, you would meet people who said, <clears throat> Sai, you know, I like you. Uh, what, what are you doing? Uh, we got this problem. How would you handle this problem? Let me, let me, I read about you did something. Let me tell you how you should have done that. <laughs> so I, I have gotten a lot of assistance and help from a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So let me let me uh, move our conversation on to um, ICMA. You've been a longtime member of, of ICMA, and there was uh, a point at which, uh, as I noted uh, in uh, in, the, in introducing you, where you became president of ICMA, the first black person to be president of ICMA. But if my recollection serves me correctly. Um, you ran for that post more than once, it seems to me. And correct me if I'm wrong. And, and, and I just generally recall it some aspect of it being a bit controversial. Am I, am I accurate in that regard, Si? And if I am, would you tell the story, please? <laughs> You're accurate, and uh, it is a story. Uh, but it, it, okay, I tell it. Uh, Mark Keene, and I, I said I was not going to call any names, but Mark Keene was the executive director of ICMA. And he, he had a group of longtime professional managers that were always with him. And all of them, of course, were white. 
And he came to me at the time that I was city manager in Cincinnati and had been getting a lot of uh, big, good press in Cincinnati. And Mark Keene said, uh, we're going to nominate you for president of ICMA. And uh, let's have a little talk about it. And I said, okay. And I had a talk with him. Well, at that time, the president actually became a person who was, you had to be elected, but you were nominated to be elected. And he did nominate, he got, I was nominated, I was on the ballot, but another city manager had gotten enough signatures to get on the ballot. Um, so there were the two of us. I was close enough to Mark that I heard, you know, Mark arguing with this other guy, with the white guy saying, look, don't rock this boat. We have it, we have it, we, we are doing what we have always done and it's going to be good for our profession. And the guy said, no, I'm still going to run. And if the elected members want me, then I will serve. Uh, and that's what happened. He ran and a majority of the members voted for him and not me. Now, there were some who thought that I would become angry. I would start writing speeches. I would think of all the negative things, but I didn't. At that point, I was a city manager, which is what I wanted to be. And I was a city manager in Cincinnati, Ohio, which was extremely significant. We even had a, a, a winning ball teams at that time. Mm -hmm. and, and I was not so mad that this guy got to be president because I didn't know what I was missing. <laughs> no, I had, I had not followed it up. So in response to the issue, yes, there were things that happened that I think from a Black Lives Matter position should not have happened, but they did in the 80s. And I lived through it, kept my job as city manager of Cincinnati, and I was appointed. I ran for the election unopposed for the next year. So that's how I got to be city uh, president of ICMA. And all is good, Mark. <laughs> so when you were, you became president, you had that year. Uh, was there an accomplishment or achievement that you're most proud of that occurred when you were president of ICMA? Oh my goodness, that's a that's a, that's a significant question, and and a, and a lot of people. A lot of people write down their accomplishments, you know, and keep them for their autobi autobiography that they're going to uh, write. Uh, I, I did it. Um, I think I accomplished two things. I accomplished visibility, visibility. He, <clears throat> this visibility was a situation where I was known, I was black, and there were a lot of other Blacks in the field by 1983 who were Black and who were city managers. And then there were a lot of students who were in colleges studying public administration. So I'm not saying that I moved the needle to the point where more Blacks became involved in city management, but I am saying that I was very visible and very visibly black. <laughs> so that when you saw me, there was no question. Uh, and it was just then a matter of what did he do or what does he not do? What does he say or what does he not say? Um, I had one significant experience uh, as president that I did not get to uh, enjoy. And I, and I think about it a lot now uh, Mark King was not the president at this time in 1983 when I got, to, was not executive director. But the new executive director 
came to me right after the election and said, uh, <clears throat> congratulations, Cy, and um, this is the calendar of events for the year that we're going to have. And he, he, he ran down all of the things that I'm certain he felt would, uh, would make me feel good. That is that I got a chance to go to Europe as president. I would go to England. I had a, I had a chance to uh, visit a whole lot of other cities as president. And at those times, even our quarterly board meetings were, 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 were held and carried on as if we were executives in some major private corporation. Uh, that's from the location of the, of the board meeting to the food, to the drink, to the speakers. And he said to me, this new executive director said, Sai, we're gonna keep all that going. Now, would you have another important responsibility? And that is you appoint the person to the ICMA retirement board. And this is the manager that I want to appoint. He was, he was just, just that out with it. He said that I want to appoint. He did not say that I'm asking you for the permission to do it and telling you why. He just said, this is the guy I want to appoint. And of course it was a, a white guy. And I just looked at him and said, uh, is it not my responsibility to appoint? And he said, it is, and that's why I'm coming to you. I am I'm being serious, Cy. Uh, this person has the skills and the intellect and the knowledge of retirement systems. Then he said that I want you to appoint. And I did. Um, all of the other slants and in non-respectful things that happen, I simply forgot about them. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting. I, you, one of the things that stuck with me in regard to what you said is you weren't sure whether or not you moved the needle. I would submit that you did, um, that you that you did move the needle, but by a lot of things, and certainly by your presence and being a, being being a black man, being a black person in that position. If it sent no other message, it said that if you can, I can, right? And and that, yes. I think that's a, that's a that's a real powerful message. And I know when I when I speak, especially to to young people, to kids, you know, I, I I always make that that point, you know, and talk about my background so that they know that it's not unlike their own, and that if I can, they can, and 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 and, and I and, and therefore I think you did move it. You moved it for me. I was like that. And I, <laughs> well, thank you, Mark. The life, right? When, when when I said at the beginning of our conversation. <laughs> Guys were larger than life to me. I, I meant that, right? It okay. Was, wanting to be be like that. So let, I, let me t let me let me bring something else up, and uh, I appreciate the, those comments. Uh, but in 1990, when I was no longer city manager, but then a professor, uh, we had the opportunity to uh, to write an uh, article, an article, and the article uh, appeared in the Par magazine, um, and it, and it's it, it the title of it was the role demands of minority public administrators. About four, can you hear me? Yes. About four of us professors got together, and we reviewed an article that was written uh, about twenty years before by uh, Dr. Adam Herbert who looked at public administrators, we didn't just say city managers, black public administrators. And the question was, in office, what are the dilemmas and the demands that come upon you just because you are black? And when he did the study, uh, 
1974, the response for those Blacks who were in positions then were the dilemmas in their demands, how to, wrong, how to walk that road between being Black and being in a white majority community, uh, having a lot of Black citizens who are defranchised, but a majority of white city council. And and supervising a, a, a white police department who, who was doing things in the black community that just were not the right things to do. Uh, that was the, the challenge. That was that was the that was a challenge. Well, when we did our study 20 years later, we found that blacks were still in leadership positions, but their issues were not at that point proved to me that you are black, but show me what you can do Education. as a black. And, and, and there are, they are two different approaches. You could, I mean, it's just two different things. But for the first 20 years, uh, the Adams report was absolutely correct. It was, you, you, you got the color, but you got to prove to us that you are black. Not prove to the city council, prove to us that you're black. Mm -hmm. So, so, and we, we, we're going to get to some some questions here in just just a minute. Uh, so, in in terms of that bar proving that you were capable, in, in your view, was it was the bar the the, the same level for for y'all as, as as black public administrators versus everyone else, or, or did you feel that it was a higher bar, a higher standard that you had to meet? Um, no, no, I don't know about the other black city managers and there were a lot of, them. you know, if you ask that question of, uh, <clears throat> of, uh, Sherry Suttles, who was the first black city manager and female in Oberlin, Michigan at the time that we were there, then you might get another answer. Uh, I don't know what issues were with Sherry whether or not she had to prove that she was black. But I know that in the cities that I was in, when I walked in the door, they saw me. You, you cannot be confused about whether or not I'm black. Correct. Whatever it is that you think black people do, then look at me. And then from that point on, the situation was now, Let's see what we do. Let's see what we do. Not, not that you got to be Superman, where the white guy did not have to be Superman, but you still have to have a balanced budget. And that budget being balanced has nothing to do with your color, except that for some of you black folks, we don't think you know what a balanced budget is. You know, that's 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 the that's the ladder that I had to climb. So, so you know where the question came from. I mean, it, it, it's no secret that you know many, many of us black people feel like you know we we have to perform above par, right? Above our yes, white yes, I yes. Mean, that, that that's been that's been the feeling you know for and that that's where the you know, that's the source of the of the question. And as you said, I mean, it, I would imagine it depends on who you ask, because I think there are others I could have asked that question who would have said, yes, absolutely, that's right. And they would have. Yes. They, they, and, 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 and what I, and I'm not saying that, that your role is harder to hold, but I am saying that you know it is, complaining about it, does not get the role hold. That's exactly right. Uh, I have I have a whole lot of of young people, mostly black, but some whites also, who have come. I, I call them my my mentees. My I mean they they're my they're my sons and daughters. But what I've always tried to show them is positive, encouraging things to get into this profession. 
I'm not going to start off by saying don't get into this profession because you may not be able to meet the standards. Standards are too high. I will never say that to them. I say to them, get in it, work at it. Get in it, work at it. And they and you will be successful, and you will know when you're successful, and you will know that it's because of who you do, who you are, and what you've done, not because of your color. And I can just list a lot of, of young people who have done that. They have they have been fired maybe here, but they have still maintained their their what do I want to call it? Their professionalism, and they have never doubted themselves. I don't have to be better than that guy, but I can still win. Now you can you can point that to whatever you want to point it to. I, I think that's great advice. I, I think that's exactly right. Listen, I, I want to segue into um, to our audience and 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 and, and checking to see if there are some questions uh, in, the, in the chat. Tammy, uh, can you can you if there are questions in the chat? Uh, yes. Here and, uh, Absolutely. Uh, the first question we've dropped in here um, is, and does I think having a mentor makes a difference for Black people in this field? I think so. And, and I guess everybody has to agree with what mentor is. Um, a mentor, the one that I think would be good is a mentor is, is somebody who not only can tell you the answer to two plus two, but who can explain to you why people are interested in two plus two and what effect does that answer have on you personally and your profession? Follow what I'm saying? I, I, I'm not, I, I have a lot of mentees, I guess is the word for it, but they are not people who I have told, you have to hire this person, you have to do this, you have to, now I have, I have, I take that back, I have gone to some, a lot of young of uh, my mentees and told them now you have to be mentee some other to some other black person. Uh, so I've done that. <laughs> but but that doesn't mean that I have to be your professor or your father. Another question. Uh -huh. Yes, this is from Tanisha. Uh, Sai, your legacy is deeper and wider than we will ever be able to accurately measure. You are intentional about your sponsorship, mentorship, and development of others. Bear with me, just moved. Huh. It's a new person now. It's, yes, here we go here. I can jump in, Tammy. Please what, do. Sh what should we be doing more or less of to carry on your legacy of building of great Black professionals? Thank you, Tanisha. Making certain that uh, your training programs, uh, your scholarships uh, are the type that are enticing to young black students also, young black students also. We know that the push today is STEM so that we are training all of our young people to do technical things, but persons who do technical things have to be managed. And you need to know enough that you know what you don't know, but you do not need to have a be a total technician. Uh, I know that technically you can't operate. We couldn't even have this, this, this event that we're having today without somebody with technical knowledge. So you want there to be a young mentee who has that knowledge. And to my benefit, I have him. His, I'm looking at him now, his name is Brian Penn. And he can bring to me, now what I can do, I call him up and say, Brian, I'm going to be on this program. You know, now, trust me, I didn't know the difference between 10 o'clock Central and 12, 11 o'clock Eastern, but Brian did. <laughs> and he called me and said, look, it's, it's, it's Central time, Sai. They're waiting for you. 
and, and he would put all of my technical issues where they should be. So in, in response to the question, I would say to young people, learn what you are to learn. So you learn the technology, but be prepared to manage the people who have who are the technicians. You want you want a man, you want to be the city manager. You don't want to be the technical assistant to the city manager. I think that's and I, I would only add to that that which has always been implicit within the M, the acronym ICMA, the management part, and that is uh, leader and leadership. You yes, know, we're not just managers, we're not just administrators, we are also leaders. And yes. I can't pick up a time in my whole career when leadership was more important for us than it is now. But give the, 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 the name of this program today speaks to it, courageous leadership. And, and that has to be part of what we are about as well. And that will mean sometimes stepping into voids that we would not have necessarily stepped into before. That will be necessary uh, going forward. So I encourage, strongly encourage, the, the leadership that's always been there by implication that needs to really stand out much more today. We need our local government managers to also be courageous leaders. So Mark, may I ask you a question? Uh, as, as the executive director of ICMA, sure. do you have any leadership responsibilities? And how, how, how are they impacted? How, how do you I, I, I do, and, and, and frankly, just 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 seconds ago, I, I was speaking to that. I, I believe part of my responsibility is to talk about uh, yes. leadership and to encourage leadership, and, and that you know there, there are times that we are going to have to step up and into circumstances that, if you think about how we were raised in the profession might seem odd or in conflict with, et cetera, but absolutely necessary. The whole world is, it has changed around us, continues to change and, 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 and at a rapid pace. Uh, and, 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 and I think that has impact on how we do these jobs going forward, not just us, but even our leadership in terms of transforming the very organizations that we're responsible for, they have to change too. They have to change in the context of becoming more agile, more flexible, more nimble, because the demands of the future, now and the future, demand that. That we have to be able to, notwithstanding the, you know, historically the bureaucratic nature of local government, you know, have to be able to pivot and change in order to respond, effect, respond effectively uh, to the changing circumstances. And I think that that's, that's going to be some of the hardest stuff for us as a profession, as managers, even ICMA as an organization has to do it. We had to do it in response to the pandemic in order to meet the immediacy of the demands that our members had as they were trying to respond. Tammy, another question from our audience? I certainly do, and my screen is unfrozen. There are three additional questions. I'll we'll see if we can get through them. Um, the first one is from Decker that says that Sai is a master at developing relationships. How did he learn that? I don't know how, by being alive, I would say Decker. <laughs> uh, and, and looking. I, I've always been the kind of person who identify people who I like, who I want to be like, and then I try to see what it is that they do that make them what they are. And one of the things that I've learned I learned from a guy named Phil Rutledge, and his position was that when you're talking to somebody, uh, know them by name and ask them, who are they? Meaning, what do they do? And when you tell them, when they tell you what they do, then ask them something about the insides of it. You follow what I'm saying? That show that you are interested in, what, in them and what they do. And you got a friend. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
Yes, I have another question that was submitted privately. Um, Sai, as we watch what has occurred in our country with the many instances of civil rest and COVID, for minority managers, I believe there are additional pressures that are placed upon us. What is the best advice you have for everyone on this call as we move forward to stabilize our communities? <laughs> that's, uh, I, that's, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. Uh, and I'm going to say something that uh, is not going to come out right, but I'm going to say it anyway. You tell everybody in your community to get in line. Mm. Now that does not mean, it should not mean that this, this is a way of saying the blacks get to the rear of the line. You're simply saying get in line. You're organized. A line means that you're organized. A line means that you know where you are trying to go to. A line means that you know how far from it you are that you're trying to go to. And a line means that you know when you are moving forward. Stay in line. I think I Do we have time? Please. Do we have time for one more? Okay. Um, Sai, the question is, uh, has Mr. Murray experienced professional exhaustion or burnout during his career? If so, what was his process for overcoming it? How was he able to combat the days when he wondered if he was making a difference or positive impact? Now that's, 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 uh, that's a tough one. Uh, let me say that in, in most situations or cases, I knew when the problem was a problem. And I knew when the problem would be escalated and what might escalate it. And, 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 I, and I'm gonna say this, I knew, I knew my limitations as to something that I could not, uh, I could not make it right. So if I saw it coming down the road and I saw the problem, then, uh, and I knew that I didn't have the ammunition to deal with it, then I won't let it bother me mentally. I will not get burned out. I will not get disillusioned from the fact, from the profession. What I would do is just uh, leave uh, if I could. That's when my friend from California would come in, you know. After six years, <laughs> uh, chances are, People get tired of seeing you, you know, so so you can leave. Uh, or it could be the other way. You can go to a place like I went to in, uh, in, in San Diego, and you don't have to make the decision. <laughs> the city council will say, no, you, you've had it. You burnt out. Bye. So it's life. Well, sorry. We have essentially run out of our time, but it has been such an honor and a privilege to have the opportunity to have conversation with you today, to do it in this way, uh, where so many people have had the opportunity to, uh, to, to hear what you have to say, your point of view about so many, many things. We have been, the profession has been, I think, blessed to, to have you as part of it. Um, I think you uh, have made it better in your journey as you continue um, to do that. You've made it more accessible and real for so many uh, uh, of us over the years. And, and that is profoundly uh, appreciated. But as we, as we close out our time today, Sai, I think it is only appropriate, my friend, uh, that you, sir, have the last word. Um. <clears throat> Uh, my last word is that I'm so very glad to see Mark Art as executive director of ICFA. And it has taken, people were saying it took so, it took 50 years for me to become the president. But we can say now it took a hundred years for a manager to become a manager 
of ICMA. Now that's 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 just too long. But the fact that Mark is there now means that ICMA understands and appreciates minorities in management because they are allowing him to manage all of us. I do not think that this emphasis on this program on Black History Week month would have occurred if Mott was not the executive director. As large as our organization is, as, as progressive as our organization is supposed to be, it took us 100 years to get an executive director. But we got the right one, and that makes up for it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for logging in and uh, spending this time with uh, Mr. Sylvester uh, Murray uh, and me. Um, so I'm truly an honor to have you with us. I want to remind you all that uh, uh, our program today has been recorded. Uh, it will be up on the ICMA website um, uh, shortly hereafter. Uh, and forevermore, you will have access to it. So I continue on. Uh, we look forward to your uh, continued amazing contributions to the profession of city management and local government. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it, Mark. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Sai.